Um, today's topic is on um, ATMs or asynchronous uh, transfer mode. Uh, but before we get into ATMs or asynchronous transfer mode, let's try to go back and revise on uh, on uh, switching okay, from from Didicom one. Uh, where we talked about circuit switching and packet switching, the two key uh, communication switching techniques that, were, that's, uh, that are available. So let's try to go back to that a bit so we can um, recap because uh, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about within ATMs revolves around uh, switching. So at least let's just recap that first before we uh, we come back to ATM. Okay, so as you, as you probably uh, remembered, um, we had two types of switching techniques. We had the the circuit switching and the and the packet switching, uh, which were the two main form of switching techniques that we had for transmission, for data transmission or communication wise. Um, circuit switching required a dedicated path transmission uh, with continuous transmission of data and uh, the telephone call the telephone network was a typical example a telephone service was a typical example of what a circuit switching uh, is because you do have that continuous transmission uh, stream uh, that is required for a telephone call to uh, to be, uh, to be transferred or to be established between two end devices that want to participate in a, in a data exchange or any information exchange. So that, that's it for the, well, that's, that's it about the circuit solution. Uh, the keywords, your key uh, uh, terms of, or expressions over here are, you need a dedicated path, okay? To be established between two devices uh, before any kind of information can be transmitted back and forth. And usually it's related to transmission that revolves around continuous uh, flow of data or continuous stream of uh, data. And usually uh, regular telephone calls is a typical example of what uh, you'd consider as a, as a circuit switching. And then you come back to the, uh, the, circuit, uh, the packet switching, which generally revolves around uh, uh, moving a packet, basically breaking that information into uh, into smaller chunks called packets, and then forwarding and storing them for transmission. Uh, so generally, you don't require a dedicated path uh, for transmission. Uh, it'd be a very very uh, uh, fast enough for interactive uh, transmissions. And like as I mentioned earlier, they usually store and then deliver the message. It's that's why it's usually termed a store and forward uh, type of transmission or switching. And uh, we did mention a typical example was uh, the internet, the internet services, uh, or more or less your web resource services revolves around uh, packet switching, where you basically access resources that's already it's already been. Uh, store at a particular point and uh, and when you need to access it you you kind of establish some kind of connectivity and it gets routed through various um, end devices in this case routers or switch or whatever it is uh, on its route to the to the far destination of where the information is where you need to either pick up the information or uh, retransmit or or retransmit the information back to. So hence the internet uh, traffic is a typical example of what you consider as a, a packet switching network. Now in the packet switching network, there are two uh, types of techniques involved. We do have the data ground packet switching and then the virtual circuit packet switching. Uh, so we have data ground packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. They both generally fall in the same category of uh, forwarding packets, uh, but the key distinctions within the, between the two 
forms of uh, packet switching, which is the datagram and then the virtual circuit, is that uh, with the datagram, it's mostly for uh, transmission of packets uh, within uh, a given uh, a network system. Uh, that requires information to be um, stored and forwarded on route to a given destination. And general doesn't require a dedicated path. But since, uh, but when it comes to the virtual circuits, uh, packet switching, uh, there's a, a reason why that was actually uh, implemented. Uh, we were, there was a point in time where we really were trying to migrate every type of um, data transmission or information over the internet, and they realize um, how do we address uh, transmissions that involve uh, uh, continuous flow of data, like uh, voice or VoIP services, voice over IP services? How do you address that under uh, packet switching, which is on the data net basically, or an, on an internet, on the internet? And then they came up with this. Um, uh, mode of transmission called the virtual circuit packet solution. Now, if you notice the word virtual circuit, kind of relates to the circuit solution. So basically, an element of the circuit solution was basically brought back into uh, packet solution to address uh, information transmission uh, that requires uh, continuous transmission flow. Uh, and, and so they, they came up with that to address that issue. So at least when you're on the uh, on a data uh, a packet switching network, you do have that option or that uh, service available to you as well. Uh, instead of, I mean, basically uh, moving back to circuit switching, you actually do have provision for you within packet switching to address your uh, constant uh, or continuous transmission flow of information data. Uh, like your voice or your VoIP services. So in the, within that transmission, uh, we'd say usually if packets are usually transmitted on a given route, on a dedicated route for that to be possible. So at least you can have that steady flow of transmission of data flow within uh, a given switching uh, technology. And you do still need um, uh, you don't necessarily need the uh, dedicated path in this case. It's just that packets uh, that revolves within the uh, virtual circuit element of it would have to be uh, routed through a given defined path or a predefined path within that given uh, network. So all packets that are related to continuous flow within a data uh, packet switching can easily flow through that without having to go through uh, different routes. Unlike the datagram uh, packet switching, uh, the packets can be broken down into various uh, segments and then routed through different routes. But since we're dealing with uh, 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 like continuous transmission flow of data, uh, you can't really uh, you can't really route them to various uh, a route that could cause a huge delay, especially when it comes to uh, your voice or your VoIP services or your VoIP transmission. You obviously don't want uh, a situation where you're making a call and a call is uh, within the packet switching network, and like your uh, WhatsApp um, calls or your Skype calls or your uh, uh, Facebook. Um, I am services, you obviously don't want that in the way that uh, information is rerouted through various routes where packets with, of the same given uh, information are routed through different uh, networks uh, on, on its routes to a given destination, which creates a problem with the synchronization of the information. So ideally, uh, a dedicated path needs to be established to make it possible for all packets of that segment uh, uh, can be tra can be transmitted on just one uh, given route instead, instead of for the instead of uh, being uh, routed on different uh, different uh, uh, or instead of it's being routed or passed through different routes, in, in, so to speak.
so in this case, within the virtual circuit packet switching, uh, your traditional your traditional calls can still be established. Your VoIP services can still be um, accommodated, uh, as well as other services that require uh, a dedicated uh, continuous flow of information or of transmission. Okay, so your with with the datagram part, uh, if you know that if you're browsing, you actually access some resource that's already been stored somewhere. And you don't necessarily, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not time constrained, basically. You can access the resources as and when the packets that have been routed through various paths uh, uh, reassembles at the final destination and then picks up the information and basically hands you back. So there's no time constraint within that. But with the virtual circuit packet switching, uh, time constraint is very, very important over here because, like I said, I pointed earlier on, uh, voice transmission, you can really break them up in a way that it can be routed to different, right? It's like saying, um, making a call and then when I say, hi, how are you? Hi gets routed to a different route, a different path. How are you gets routed to a different path. And then they all have to be re, uh, uh, reassembled at the destination end, at the receiving end. Uh, that would probably create a lot of delays for the other party to get the full, hey, how are you message. Okay? So ideally, it's not uh, uh, a, good a, good, a good approach to carry uh, some of those um, continuous um, transmission of information over the, the datagram uh, packet switching, but instead uh, provisions was made within the uh, virtual circuit packet switching. Okay, so in this case, it's more virtual as compared to pure circuit. The system comes up with various algorithms uh, to, uh, to, to, to be able to handle how the the routes are going to be done logically over a virtual stream or a virtual uh, implementation. So at least you can get the feel of your circuit solution by in a virtual form to address your transmission needs. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much the key uh, uh, roundup of what uh, your your switching technologies were, were all about when we talked about it in data communication one. Uh, it's covered in chapter 10 of uh, William Stalin's book. You can go back and read up on it. You can get a lot more if you've I mean, forgotten some of the keys that we talked about or some of the various uh, uh, information that was covered under, under uh, switching technologies. You can go back and read up on it. I just want to brush you guys out, bring you up to speed on that, so at least we can move forward to the um, ATM, which also has a bit of some of the switching involved. Okay. So great. Now, once again, before we, are, we are, I want to I want to talk a bit more about uh, coming back to the ATM, uh, covering the. Uh, the switching or recapping on the switching technologies that we have or techniques that we have. Uh, asynchronous uh, transfer model ATM, uh, it's, it's more or less uh, another transmission means of uh, transmit of carrying information across a, very, uh, across a medium, uh, but with a much more enhanced uh, uh, and uh, and high capacity related, okay. But a brief history before we, before we, uh, we before before we got to ATM, uh, we did start out with uh, uh, what you call when 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 uh, the internet design or packet switching in general was being designed. Uh, uh, before that, they had to come up with various ways of handling information transmission across various mediums. Uh, especially from uh, interfaces of uh, various uh, systems across various networks. And the early standard that was built to address transmission that related to uh, 
moving moving data across various uh, uh, interfaces was the X.25 standard. Uh, it was actually set to manage interface uh, cooperation between whole systems, which is like your terminal stations and uh, various other end devices that you might have, and over uh, a packet switch network. So in other words, uh, ATMs actually is a packet switching network. Okay, but in its evolution to that, uh, there were various standards implemented first. And that's what we're basically talking about. The first one happens to be uh, the, the X.25 uh, standard. Like I said, it was actually designed as a, as a standard to manage interfacing co uh, cooperation between uh, local systems and then a given packet switching network. It is actually considered, which is still on the X.25 standard, it is actually considered as one of the initial standards, uh, standard stage packet switching networks. So generally it was the first packet switching implementation uh, to handle uh, data transmission. Okay, as an evolution point from, from an evolution point of view. Um, and um, it provided a pathway for full packet switching technologies uh, with functionalities generally specified on uh, three main levels. That's at the X.25 implementation uh, standard. We had the physical, the link, and then the packet level of transmission. So those were the three key functionalities specified under the, uh, the X.25 standard. Okay. Um, for effective transmission, the X.25 standard needs to uh, append various control information as headers uh, from each level of transmission uh, to create a packet which made it quite uh, uh, weighted. So obviously, if you're going to attach a number of uh, or append a uh, number of control information, which are your head information, onto the given uh, standard, onto that given standard, it, it really creates. Uh, an overweighted uh, transmission and, 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 and ideal, ideally for, for high capacity and faster transmission, it wasn't that uh, effective in that sense because if you're transmitting an information and it has a standard to it, that requires you to uh, add a number of head information to it. It makes it quite overweighted or quite weighted in terms of the transmission. I mean, I, it was great for initial, you know, uh, uh, packet switching, uh, high capacity information transmission, but due to the extra loads of uh, uh, control information added as headers, it became quite weighted. So it didn't really address uh, faster transmission. Yes, it had the option to address high capacity, uh, at the time, at, at its initial implementation or concept as a standard, but it just it was just too over, overweighted, basically, or too weighted to uh, to handle fast transmission, you know. And since uh, time is a huge sense in how we transmit information, uh, either either at a low capacity or high capacity, time is very essential. So it wasn't that very efficient with, 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 with the uh, uh, with the uh, the implementation of actually having to append various uh, control information as headers onto the uh, onto that standard for transmission. So in the process, engineers came together and realized uh, it was just not addressing the. Uh, speed and and, and, and and transmission needs. So they they basically went back to drawing board and came up with a different another a new uh another standard or more or less a next uh, evolution of the packet switching transmission. And that was named the frame relay another part of uh packet switching 
or another variant of packet switching okay that was implemented uh, mostly designed to address uh, uh, or provide more efficient transmission scheme than the x.25 standard so obviously yes engineers realized the uh, x.25 wasn't quite uh, efficient or effective in terms of uh, how it handled transmission schemes across the, the network so they decided to um, uh, to come up with a much more efficient uh, approach and that's where the frame really uh, came up or evolved yep and now the design of the frame relay uh, eliminated much of the overheads you know if you remember carefully as i mentioned earlier on the X.25 standard was weighted due to the uh, pending of various control information or head information on a given on a given data transmission that was uh, 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 that was being uh, uh, conveyed across the network. So it became uh, quite sluggish uh, in terms of time and speed. So, so one of the key things that the frame really was designed to address was was to make sure that uh, they eliminates the overhead associated with the X25 standard, uh, especially at the user end of the system and the packet switcher network. Um, so the question is, how did they accomplish that? Well, hand information uh, for uh, for managing controls such as flow controls. Uh, error controls uh, were generally handled uh, by a higher layer or a higher level layer of the frame relay design. So, which means within the design, uh, they they, uh, they had to uh, provision a different layer, a different architecture that was designed to handle that part of the overhead. So, that when it comes to overhead information which included your flow controls, your error controls, and what have you. They designed a specific higher level layer uh, to address it, to basically handle it. So at least information can just flow through the, the respective um, um, layer without causing too much delay. So only you, so um, in other words, the users, user data frames uh, was only sent from the source to destination without the header information from hub to hub. That were attached to the frame every single time, like you did for the X of 25. Okay, with the X of 25, like I said, it was a whole bunch of uh, appending of uh, head information at every given hop. That information was being routed through over the network, and that caused that usually that definitely that uh, obviously caused the uh, the weightedness on it. So to address that, this was. Uh, 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 was resolved with, with creating uh, various layers and higher layers actually handled the control uh, measures while the actual data was just basically uh, sent across from source to destination. So that basically made it uh, much faster and, and quicker to transmit uh, data within a uh, frame relay. We don't have to deal with the overheads that came that, that was being appended at every single hop or layer sorry every single hop or end device that the uh, information passed through okay the uh, one of our key advantage of uh, frame relay is that uh, uh, the, the, the data was well streamlined in terms of communication process and protocol functionalities required at the uh, user network interface level uh, was reduced significantly, resulting in a lower delay and higher throughput. So obviously, if you did minimize some of the uh, overheads that, that accompany the X.25 standard, you were, you were able to achieve improvement in throughput and uh, and also delay. You also, you also you also were able to minimize delay on the other side. Uh, so in other words. Um, uh, the improvement in throughput as compared to the 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 the, the, the X25 uh, was very very significant 
and uh, speeds of up to 2 megabits per second and even sometimes more uh, uh, were accessed on firm relay uh, lease line. An example was a T1 uh, connection. I remember when I was in college, we had T1 connections that was 1.5 and it was very, very accommodating uh, for for high capacity transmission. Uh, obviously today it wouldn't be it wouldn't be that much, you know. But I mean, back then, any uh, homes or businesses that had uh, that were using firm really leased uh, lines when joined, you know, a maximum of you know two meg per second transmission. Can you imagine that back then? I can barely get two meg. Like, well, I get I only get about four meg on my home network, my home internet uh, broadband service today, and we're in the 2021, right? And uh, think about that. Way back in the 80s and 90s, we were enjoying 1.5 meg. And it's the 2021, and we we are still that sluggish uh, dealing with uh, 4 meg per second. That is such a, a thing. Huh? And we don't even own, uh, sorry, we, we don't even own uh, a frame really. We own a much, much higher uh, uh, network. You know, today we are using 4Gs and fiber optics and what have you these days. And we still, you know, uh, constrained to 4 meg or 5 meg at most. That is that is terrible. So anyways, yeah, so Frim really uh, gave that uh, option to the early days uh, for users or service provider to uh, to provide at least a minimum of uh, or a maximum of uh, two meg per second uh, for for service for access needs when it comes to transmission uh, of information okay so up so I mean within the within all of that you had uh, you did have challenges here and there but at least it was able to address uh, key number of challenges that uh, X.25 standard, I mean, held, you know. So it was a bit, it was in a way a step up. Frame Relay was in a way a step up from the initial standard uh, that was implemented within packet switch network. Are we good? Great. So now let's come back. So now the other uh, improvement so maybe in this case, address higher speed capacity and even address a number of other issues that relate to flow controls and error controls was when ATM was implemented or made provision for ATM. So ATM will probably be like the, the second evolution of packet switching uh, networks. So we had the X.25 standard. And then we followed by the uh, frame relays that was supposed to address the overheads, the weighted overheads that were on X25 uh, um, standards. And then we moved on to uh, ATMs. So that's where uh, we come to uh, ATM. That's where asynchronous transfer moves. So that, that more or less the third installment of, of packet, uh, packet switching uh, transformation or evolution over the years. Okay, great. Now let's delve into the uh, ATM. Overviews, we're gonna be looking at um, brief intro to ATMs. Uh, look at some of the issues that uh, drove land to change to high capacity transmission. Uh, and then we'll also look at uh, ATM and its land configuration, ATM basic cell formats, uh, that makes it a high capacity transmission as compared to previous versions of packet switching transmissions. Uh, and then we also look at the conceptual models uh, slash networks in, uh, within ATMs. Uh, we also look at the protocol architecture that makes it a, a much, uh, much, 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 uh, much higher capacity transmission option. Uh, within the packet switching uh, evolution. And then we'll look at the uh, quality of services and 